Greetings and hallucinations to all you folks out there. I've got a one versus one for you today, and this one's going to be on a map that I have not casted in a long, long time. It is Roanoke Abyss, which is a very large map. This is a 20k, if I'm not totally mistaken. Uh, it's not quite that far uh, from one spawn to the other, but for a one versus one map, this is freaking huge. So we're going to go ahead and dive into this. It is a semi-pro level replay. TA for life versus Shades of Blue. TA is in the blue on the bottom and Shades of Blue is in the red. And I'm going to have to be very careful about my nomenclature on this one because if I say blue, I could be referring either to the blue color for TA for life or blue name in the red UEF. So we'll just have to try to be careful to be clear about what we're talking about and hopefully we can get through this together. Just a friendly reminder, um, I went over this on my live cast. I'm going to start doing the live cast on a set map. And this week, the map is Crazy Rush. So if you play Crazy Rush, you have an epic game. Send me the replay. The best replay from Crazy Rush I am going to cast for the live cast on Saturday. And then we'll be announcing a new map on Saturday. And that's just to help people... It's to help people get motivated to play new, play different maps, to get a little bit of fresh air into the game for all you guys who may be stuck on the same thing over and over again, whether that be Canis or Wonder or whatever it is. Maybe get you a little bit more variety in the map selections in the game lobby. So, without further ado, let's go ahead and dive in and see what these players are doing. Hopefully, we can get through this game in a reasonable amount of time. Shades of Blue, going for a pretty standard build here. We're going for, let's see, seven power generators, air factory, a whole bunch more power generators, and then a second air factory. When you have a larger map, actually, I may be wrong, this may be a 10k. I'm not 100% sure. I should have looked up before I came all this way to cast this game. Um, anytime you have a larger map that's especially got segmented land sections, you're going to want air. Lots and lots and lots of air because drops are essential. Bombers are essential for denying drops. Air control is essential for denying bombers. Basically, for to do anything on this map, you've got to have air. So I imagine TA for Life is also doing an air-heavy build. We already have one air factory planned out. I don't know anything after that. We'll just have to see... See what comes at us as the game rolls on. These islands do have a fair little bit of reclaim. We've got a lot of little boulders scattered around here, although by subcom scaling, these are definitely not tiny. Any of those would easily crush a small building. Um, that's going to give you the mass to potentially get up a T2 mass extractor early or build lots and lots of units in order to expand much more quickly. Got engineers pinging off to the sides to pick up these mass extractors. Even got a little mana reclaim queued up, which is not a bad idea at all, especially when you have a nice little chunk of mass like that just sitting waiting for the taking. And we do have land factories queued up for shades of blue on the outside edges as well. And that is going to let him get a little bit more of a presence on the field. When you have that factory, basically the opponent has to actually kill the factory in order to eliminate the expansion. And it just buys you a little bit of extra time to respond to things. First transport is going to be out for TA for life. Just barely edging out Shades of Blue. This is looking like an almost identical build. Um, we are going to have a single drop right here. And then the remainder of the engineers flying up to the North Island. I know I've mentioned it before, but just so everybody knows, because this is a question that I've gotten asked on occasion. If you want to drop a single unit, you open up the transport, select a unit on the transport, place your drop order, and just that unit will drop in that location. Then you can sequentially drop the rest of them using the shift key, or you can issue a general drop command for the transport, and it will drop all remaining units in the transport. So you can see he dropped half the engineers there, queued up three of them, pl uh, placed the drop, and then he is angling up here to go ahead and try to snag this island as well. And he does have this transport scouted, as does Shades of Blue. Shades of Blue did have an air scout down that way. Now this interceptor is going to pick it off, but I think he's going to get the engineer drop before that happens. I don't see him getting this expansion though. You can see all engineers pulling in to assist this land factory. It's going to be a huge advantage for Shades of Blue as far as build time is concerned. <clears throat> TA for life is going for the point defense, but I guarantee you first unit out of this factory is going to be an artillery, and it's going to squash that incursion into his territory no problemo. The ACU for TA for life is actually headed out to the left side. That is going to 
pretty much assure him beyond a shadow of a doubt securing that expansion because anything coming down off of a drop unless you have like five transports full of tanks is going to die to that ACU no problemo all of these little engineers fleeing in terror from the artillery that is moving up from the back to fire upon them that point defense is going to go down without hitting too much it's going to fire oh I take that back units are streaming into it not too not too savvy on the move orders there bud and it looks like the engineers are going to move out placing down an anti-air turret to hopefully secure the area against any bombers that should be coming and then they will build who knows what we'll just have to wait and see back here in the base shades of blue has got a second land factory online he did cancel the air factory order so he only has one unassisted air factory going at the moment but TA for life is doing just about exactly the same thing so at this exact second production is the same but TA for life does have a second air factory coming online that is immediately going to go after a tech 2 upgrade so we're probably going to see Corsairs possibly we will see T2 drops that just gives you that little bit of extra speed and carrying capacity to get units to the other end of the map more efficiently. Also with the T2 transport, you can potentially um, get past interceptors because T2 transports and interceptors have the same flight speed. If you can get past the interceptors, they can never catch you. However, interceptors have faster acceleration. No, wait, they, I think they have the same acceleration, but they have a tighter turning radius than the transport does. They're going to change directions a little bit more quickly. So as long as you are good with your interception routes, you should technically be able to drop a T2 transport with interceptors. It just takes a little bit of savvy on how exactly you accomplish that. So Naval Factory is going down for TA for life. That is awfully close to the landmass for Shades of Blue where he could potentially stream in a ton of build power from the now two land factories down in that area. You want Bomber coming in for a little bit of harassment? That never hurt anybody. Anytime you can lay a little damage, it is a good time. But my concern here is that this could easily get creeped by Torp launchers if Shades of Blue so desires. It appears Shades of Blue has a higher eco. He is power stalling ever so slightly, pulling in 59 mass per tick. And it looks like TA for life is at 60, somewhere around 60. So he does have more. The reclaim is so volatile, though, that you can't really see what is going on. Engineers being bombed out by that bomber. Well, of course, what else would a bomber do? It's got three kills to his name. So worth the mass, and this is not good. Three T1 bombers coming in for shades and he actually reclaimed the t1 anti-air right there those bombers side in on those engineers that will put a a brutal stop on plans over here for ta for life but he did get that frigate out a little bit worse for rare where but he is going to be able to drop those bombers if only he would get those interceptors on the case to actually help out with that I am glad my tongue tiedness is not as bad as it was in the last cast, but apparently it is still around. You can just speak more clearly. Engineer War has been won by TA for life. He's going to secure this little expansion over here. A nice little attack move order was more than sufficient to take out that engineer. And it looks like we're going to try for a little bit of a snatch and grab here. The only problem is this engineer is already on patrol, so he may or may not auto reclaim this engineer that's coming in we'll just have to see how those guys interact two frigates out for ta for life he is pushing those reasonably well and he is going to get the drop on that engineer so a second engineer war one by ta for life this is going to push his map control up just barely over 50 percent ta for life and shades both have the three main islands that they should have but as far as all of the little outlying islands and the naval presence, it looks like TA for life, at least at this exact second, is ahead. And as soon as I say that, I notice that there are five factories going down back home, which means that unless TA gets a massive amount of build power on very, very quickly, he is going to get outpaced in naval production. He's got four frigates online to two here at the base, and he is going to drop those engineers. But this is a lot of engineers right here that are reclaiming. Should they choose to dip a toe into the water, 
TA for life just simply doesn't have the build power to deny that. And now five frigates, but one of them is pretty much guaranteed to die in this little conflict right here. There they go, gonna drop one, and ooh, there we go. There's the kill. All right, and there's a snatch for Shades of Blue. Back and forth she goes. Islands swapping hands. That ACU, I, it, it always makes me nervous on these big maps when ACUs wander way out into the water because at 10 minutes into the game, anybody could potentially have T2 air, as TA for Life does actually. Right there, got that engineer up in order to get that T2 power online. Torpedo bombers are a plague for ACUs stranded out in the middle of the water. You're not going to be able to get your ACU out of there. The walking speed is very, very slow. Even a couple of bombers will be able to kill your ACU before you can get to safety. There goes more anti-air destruction from Shades of Blue. He's actually using his warrior class engineers on this one. There we go, torpedo defense creep. I was afraid of that. You can see the range on these is actually quite good for a T1 naval unit. Um, it outranges subs and frigates, and you can build them within range of the factories, and it will start plinking away at the build power, eliminating that little bit by little bit. And if, actually not if, because he will succeed, when Shades of Blue forces these factories out, he will have a nice little chunk of reclaim here. Nothing too terribly huge, but several thousand mass worth of reclaim with an easy grabbing distance of his engineers that are already in the area and I think was that a message oh well I shall investigate later Corsairs moving up towards the north at least one Corsair let's see we don't have any T2 power online yet it looks like we just have a clustered up group of T1 power generators which is asking for trouble when there's Corsairs online I guarantee you that is going to make a beeline for the power. There she blows, and yes. It's going to be a bit of damage to these power generators and the ACU. To potentially take out engineers there as well. With the Corsair, you got to kind of watch yourself. There's the second Corsair that's going to spray out across those power generators. If you can link up sequential attacks... With the Corsairs, you're going to be able to chain reaction a lot of those power generators at once. Between standing in the power generators and taking damage from that and the Corsairs passing, we've got 4,000 damage to the ACU, but TA for Life is actually making the good choice here. He is sacrificing his Corsairs knowing that he will not be able to kill that ACU before his Corsairs get shot down and doing as much damage as he can to the Eco. However, he only killed off a few of those T1 power generators, but it was enough to force his opponent into a power stall, which is about the worst place you can possibly be at this stage of the game because this is right at the point where you need to be expanding your eco um, so that you can step into the higher tech navy, which uh, there's a lot of assistance on that. That is going to be T2, and you're going to be wanting to get larger combat units online, and when you're power stalling, you simply cannot do that because the higher on the tech tree you go, the more power you're spending, and yeah, it just does not work very well. Thankfully, though, he still does have enough frigates in the water that regardless of how his production is going to be going for the next minute or so, he will be able to stay in control of his area of the water. Now, this is actually an interesting turn of events. We have a T2 naval factory in the back here that is going exclusively sub-hunters for production, and that is going to give TA for Life the ability to slaughter any group of frigates that comes his way and even the destroyers that will surely be headed out in just a moment because UEF Navy cannot combat torpedo units unless you build coopers. The rest of their Navy just simply can't deal with it. Um, you have T1 subs, you have coopers, and you have the Atlantis. That's basically the only three units that have any significant torpedo damage whatsoever. So you have that allows you to force your opponent into building coopers and that gives you an advantage in the already weak UEF T2 Navy stage because you can build a handful of uh, Salem's that perpetually hammer the Navy from that 20 extra range that Cybern has while you're just poking and prodding around the edges wherever there aren't coopers 
and killing off any super any surface units that pose a threat. It's kind of interesting. You could do, I, I think you could do a pretty inter. Oh, that was brutal right there. Lots of engineers killed off. Frigates coming in to clean up the rest of the build power, or at least attempt to, sacrificing themselves for the greater good of the navy. But that Corsair is just pounding that build power. Um, UEF T2 Navy theoretically is the strongest just because of the damage numbers but in reality they have such a serious number of weaknesses that it, it makes it very hard UEF Rush is deceptively good because the destroyer does such good ah there we go I'm gonna split up the screen here because this is a lot going on on two different halves of the map um, the UEF destroyer has by far the highest surface damage of any of the destroyers but that shorter range hampers it and then it can't defend itself with or, or from torpedo units and then the Cooper is the single strongest torpedo unit in this entire game but since it's a surface unit it can get attacked by surface units and torpedo units which is a crippling disability so you end up having to mix the UEF Navy quite heavily and if you make the slightest mistake on your unit mix, you will absolutely get slaughtered. This is not working out as well as I thought it would. I'm going to go back to the central view. And that, friends, is why I rarely use, if ever, the split screen function. Because inevitably, you end up having the action close back together in the middle somewhere. And you end up with both sides of the screen focusing on the same thing. Oh, well. I tried. So the T2 Navy let's see, is mostly on the north side. We did finally secure the Navy down here for Shades of Blue. He was able to kill off all of those frigates, but now he's having a little bit of an issue in the North Sea because he does not have any torpedo units, as we were just talking about. So he's got frigates to deal with, and he has a T2 sub hunter that is just pouring damage into whatever it can get within reach of, and nothing can really hit it back. We've got torpedoes, Coming in from these stationary defenses, though, and that is going to help out quite substantially. Subheading around the back just to scope out what's there. Looks like that is going to be... Nope. It was on a patrol order. Now it is on a patrol order. Just to secure things in the back. Now remember, both UEF and Cybran have amphibious engineers that actually float on the water. So torpedoes can kill off the engineers. And this T2 sub... Just patrolling in the back here is going to prevent any units from going into the water on the back side. A single volley from a T2 sub will kill a T1 engineer. They're actually fairly efficient at it. So that has actually vetted. That hunter has got six kills on it, which is fairly impressive for a naval unit. The health numbers are so high on the naval units that getting any number of kills on them is pretty impressive simply by itself. And the veterancy is lending a bit of regen to it. Gonna be able to just camp out under all of these frigates and just happily eat away at them. How kind of them to travel with the sub and stay in range so that it can damage them even more. Shades of Blue doing TA for life about the biggest favor you could possibly ask for right there. TA is in the water still. Does he have the torpedo upgrade? I think not. Let's see. Let's actually click on the commander and see what's going on here. That is a completely and totally unupgraded commander. None whatsoever. If you were to have the torpedo upgrade, that would be incredibly helpful because he'd be able to lay into all these frigates with 200 DPS on massive range. The Cybran ACU is actually pretty fearsome in the Navy. You can get that stealth upgrade and the torpedo upgrade and just go to town on any amount nearly. I, I say that, but you could technically flood it out with T1 subs. You can go against just about any amount of T1 Navy and even go toe-to-toe -to -toe with a couple of destroyers in the early T2 phase just with your commander because of the range options on it. You actually have to get vision on it if you have the stealth upgrade because, yeah, you won't be able to fire at it if you can't see it. Frigate's moving in. We've got a couple of Salem's out in the water now. It looks like the T1, or not T2, T, T2 subs. Let me slow down for a minute, Brink. Slow down. Get it out of your mouth so everybody knows what you're talking about. 
No more T2 subs, at least for the next couple of minutes. We're looking at Salem production, which is honestly the better way to go once you get a handle on the situation. You're going to have that lovely 80 range and brutal torpedo damage as well. Those are going to be able to easily compete with any of these frigates that are coming in and then even the destroyer that is pulling in the rear. Torpedo Bomber mopping up on the left side for TA for life. Unfortunately, it takes a lot of frigate fire to drop a Torpedo Bomber, and there are quite a few over there. I don't know why Shades of Blue is not simply killing them all off because he has a far superior number of interceptors, but when he's patrolling them around out here, they will eventually run out of fuel, and that could be a very serious problem. All the Salems are still alive, pounding away at this Navy, and it looks like Shades of Blue is going to get hemmed up and pushed back. And one thing you can see on this map that is pretty typical of the higher level players, look at all the engineers. You've got engineers everywhere reclaiming the entire map on a continuous loop of patrols and attack move orders. And that is a lovely thing to behold and something that everyone should be copying. Three sub hunters on the south side, pegging all those engineers and preparing to move in to do more damage. The reclaiming player will usually win over the non-reclaiming player, barring some weird set of circumstances. Shades of Blue still struggling for power. He is building more T2. It looks like he was on that T2 gen right there for quite some time. And I would say that the number is not that bad, but you can see even when he's positive mass, he has still negative power. I don't know how he let his situation get that bad. There have not been any major combat situations recently that uh, hampered his building power. It's just, I guess he forgot to do it. TA for life, on the other hand, sitting very, very nicely on his power. You can see when he hits large chunks of reclaim, he briefly drops into the negative, and then he has enough extra power built to get his storage back up full before the next reclaim hits. He is very, very slowly building another T2 generator, but honestly, his power is looking very good at the moment. Let's see, 2.1 income on power. We've got 16,000 mass reclaimed and 99 steady income. Shades of Blue sitting on around 100 or so. It's hard to tell with the power stall and the reclaim coming in. He has reclaimed more so far. Nine or 22,222 right when I start looking at oh you had to go up one you just had to go up one that was a treat so nicely done for shades of blue on the mass side of eco it just simply did not scale his power up to match and he needs to get a shield over that before that thing goes up in flames because we still have air combat units no more Corsair so I guess it's not that big of a deal but you don't want exposed power at any point in the game when you've got both players at T2 air and you've got Navy online. Because if a cruiser or a destroyer slips in just a little bit too close, you're going to end up having a really bad time when your power goes up. So destroyers moving in, those are going to be able to range the frigates. Just kind of kite around in circles and fire in at those units. Laying a little bit of damage before they get close. With the frigates, of course, you're going to want to dive in as close as you can, as fast as you can. Because mass for mass, frigates are stronger when they're in range. The strength of the destroyer is its kiting capabilities versus frigates. Looks like they are going to be able to mop the floor with that group pretty reasonably well. And then on the left-hand side, mopped clean. TA for life has eliminated Shades of Blue Navy in this position. It looks like he's got all of his T1 Navy paws, throwing down yet another T2 power generator, bringing him up to 2.9 income. That is 1K positive. I imagine he is probably getting ready to drop a T3 Naval upgrade. At this point, that is about the only thing that can save him. He has actually superior eco to TA for life. He has superior reclaim. But the UEF T2 Navy just sucks so much, especially versus Cybran, that he is going to get forced into that T3 move simply to keep up. The battle cruisers do match range with the Salem's. That is their one redeeming quality besides their brutal DPS 
And once you can get the bulwarks online, that makes up for the health deficit between the battle cruiser and the Salem's. So once you can get two battle cruisers and about three, four, maybe five bulwarks in one spot, Cyber Navy is royally screwed. However, there are still groups of sub hunters around, and battle cruisers, like any of the other UEF units, cannot deal with torpedoes. So he is going to get forced into building building some coopers intermittently. Um, honestly, if I go for the T3 upgrade, I simply produce uh, battle cruisers and battleships on my T3, and then I'll go ahead and drop a support factory on one of these others and assist that to get the shielding and coopers. Usually the best way to do it. It's it's kind of an interesting mix because two of the factions, Cybern and UEF, the ones that we're seeing here, really don't need to build T2 main combat units once they hit T3 because the Cybern battleship has the high rate of fire it needs to deal with lower tier units such as hover or frigates mass efficiently. It's not going to be doing the massive overkill that the other battleships do, just wasting tons and tons of damage on the small units. By the same token, the UEF battlecruiser, once you can get it online, because of the continuous beam, um, it can flip from one unit to the next and it really doesn't waste much, if any, DPS. So you're going to be able to use the battle cruiser versus hover, destroyers, frigates, whatever, whatever other navy is thrown at it, and it can take care of itself very, very well. Now, this is a bad idea to leave your navy still when there's a UEF cruiser online. That cruiser's actually got 19 kills. Most of it is air, as it should be, but it did manage to kill off two destroyers right there, sitting right next to each other, taking AOE damage from a single volley of missiles. So terrible loss for TA for life. He still does have two destroyers here versus two destroyers up here, which is, yeah, those are sitting still, so they're going to take all the damage and die horribly. But it's still not something that you should lose if you're paying attention. And it looks like it's about to, nope, not going to happen again. Those guys are on the move. On the left-hand side, Sub Hunter is still moving up and around the map. Those guys are going to slip around the back. It looks like, yes, for a new patrol order, around the back of the island. We have a single solitary Salem plinking away at all these T2 mass extractors trying to rein in Shades of Blue's eco. That is probably going to put him below TA for life. You can see TA has a lot of T1 mass extractors still all over the place, whereas Shades of Blue has almost entirely T2 mass extractors even on his single island expansions out here in the back. So he has focused on eco a lot more than TA for life has, and TA is about to start knocking some of that out. Looks like TA is sitting on 26,000 reclaim and 157 mass income, not counting that reclaim. While well, Shades of Blue is on, let's see, 188. 136 with 25,000 reclaim. So, doing reasonably well. He does have a strap bomber out, which is a very interesting move. He's going to overkill that sonar by such a ludicrous amount. I don't even know why he did that. He's throwing out the GG, which honestly I think is a little premature. He's got the T3 factory upgrading, and well, there's this closing in, which is not going to be healthy, but as soon as they get in range of these torp launchers, those are gonna die. This strat bomber could potentially do a lot of work, but we have a lot of interceptors over here for TA for life that could potentially take it down. We'll just have to see how this plays out. Torpedo bomber coming in, laying in some extra damage on those factories. Build power going down left, right, and center for Shades of Blue. He's gonna have a ton of mass and no way to spend it, which is a bad way to do subcom. It is always remember that there is a trifecta in subcom you've got mass energy and build power you have to balance three together and not having the build power to spend your mass is this is in the game the same difference as not having the mass to spend because you can have all the mass in the world and if you can't spend it you still don't have any units to show for it that strap bomber is going to get shot down taking out a couple of t2 mass extractors and a couple of units here and there but overall not being incredibly useful However, on the naval front, we're going to see a lot of T2 torpedo bombers pumped out. Hopefully, those will be able to regain Shade's footing while he is trying to rebuild his navy. He basically has none whatsoever 
except for this tiny, tiny group of T2 down on that side, which cannot retreat. It's got to stay down there and face off against this group of Navy in the south. Well, there's not much of a group, but I guarantee you TA for life would exploit that gap should he move. Torpedo bombers winging in for the Salem's. There is no sonar. There we go, coming in sight. Now those torpedo defenses are going to start firing and just hammering those T2 subs. The DPS on those guys is brutal. Couple of Coopers to keep that guy safe and that Neptune could potentially swing the tide of this war. There's a single solitary cruiser over there on that corner and one, I thought I saw one in the south. Apparently not. And TA for life, getting an upgrade. That was probably the T3 upgrade, he already has T2. I would not have my commander out in the middle of the water without a cruiser nearby. There is one up here, but not super close to the ACU when there's a good 15 torpedo bombers hovering around my Navy. That just seems really, really dangerous to me. I don't know why he's doing that, especially when he doesn't need to. He is winning in every possible way at the moment, except for this battle cruiser that's coming out. And he should just sit back, guard his commander, and push this win home. But mm, playing it dangerous. Destroyers are getting obliterated by these T2 subs. There's a little bit of torpedo defense coming online, but it's not going to be enough. That destroyer going down, and the Navy is going to regroup for TA for life. He's now got more than enough online to handle this group here. And he's got the interceptor and cruiser coverage to deny those torpedo bombers, which are moving back over to the left. Looks like they're going after the sonar. Nope. Further north, going to try to save the battle cruiser. Just remember, if you're in range of the battle cruiser, the battle cruiser is in range of you. He just needs to get line of sight on it. There we go, zapping that sucker and moving on to other targets. Just needs to bite the bullet and get in. There we go. I believe these guys have like 500 DPS, something ludicrous like that. That was such insanely high DPS. The only problem with them is that low 25,000 health. They're quite expensive for such a papery amount of health. You gotta use those bulwarks to get the full effect out of them. Cyber Navy moving up. UEF Navy falling back. All right. This is this is a hard one to call. I think about five minutes ago, I would have said for a certainty that Shades of Blue was going to lose. And things definitely still don't look good for him. But they look better than they did just a few minutes ago. A cruiser is around the back. It's going to start harassing Shade of Blue's spawn point. And those are ASF online. Cruiser is slowly but surely damaging them. Um, Shades is going to need to bring something around the back to kill that thing. It looks like he's got three Coopers, two Bulwarks, and a half-health battle cruiser, which is a reasonably good battle grouping. You don't want to mess with that when all you've got is two destroyers because UEF is going to win on those numbers. Build power going down for Shades of Blue. This is a recurring theme. Cannot lose the build power. And you can see the blue presence on the map is slowly but surely whittling away at the red markers and pushing them back to whence they came. Like Shades of Blue is going to hide out under his shields. Bulwarks on this side as well, and the second battle cruiser is going to come online. Now that there's two together with a group of shields, I think this cyber navy is doomed because I don't see any clump of navy concentrated enough to deny two battle cruisers. See this battle cruiser right here? Zap goes the destroyer, and then a single firing cycle from both cannons is enough to kill a cruiser with a battle cruiser because the health is just not there to deny those shots. There he goes, down she goes, down into the deep blue sea of Davy Jones' locker, and this battle cruiser is going to wrap back around the island to the front. Engineers moving out for Shades of Blue to try and snag some of this lovely reclaim, but it looks like TA for Life is mopping it up with every bit of build power he can possibly get online. I like the Salem's bridging the shore there. 
getting all up in the business and trying to eliminate that eco. Looks like Shades of Blue has pulled in 42,000 reclaim and is sitting on about 85 to 90 mass income. And then TA for Life has 100 and 195, I think. That looks like an accurate number. And 52,000 reclaim. So all these engineers finally paid off. He got his units far enough up into Shades of Blue's business that he's able to reclaim all of the previous combat deaths from the map. So that's going to start giving him a tremendous map's advantage, even past what he has due to mass extractors alone. He's already claimed this expansion, and he is now moving in on this one over here. Things do not look good for Shades of Blue. TA for Life still pushing up that commander. I'm not... Ugh. I need to stop commenting on it because he is a 1700, almost 1800 rank ladder player. He is far better than I am, but I mean, come on, when you got UEF Navy right there and somebody who has T3 air available to them, you don't extend your commander like that. Not sure what he's doing, honestly. Looks like we've got Salem's moving in on the build power here. There's a full health battle cruiser. Duking it out with those units, the combined DPS of these two is easily going to take out all the TA has. So I don't think there's any specific worry of losing the T3 tech, but there is the problem of losing even more build power. All right, Shades of Blue, when are you gonna die? Two battle cruisers cannot keep you alive forever. We gotta see an air snipe or something coming out. This TA has complete and total map control at this point. Losing the last factories you have on that expansion to engineers. Those dang combat engines, man. Been at it since the beginning of this game. I do love UAF T3 Navy. It is just so damn cool looking. Uh, micro in circles, avoid the Salem fire. Focus on those beams, and Destroyer goes kablooey. All right, things are actually going to calm down slightly here. Definitely don't want to be streaming in these Destroyers one at a time. That is the surest way for them to die. As we see right there. Ah, TA for life. Looks like he's pulling a harm creep. Well... That is one of the more intriguing things I've seen today. Not sure what he's planning on accomplishing with a harm creep. Theoretically, he should be able to eliminate the battle cruiser threat because battle cruisers have no area of effect and no significant torpedo damage. So the harms will be able to effectively hem in the battle cruisers on this side. Let's see, yeah, he's planning on building them this way, but he will not be able to lock down the T3 factory because the harms are way too far away. You can see the range on those things ends right there. If you were able to harm creep from this island, you would do the same thing as that T1 torpedo defense creep we saw on the right-hand side earlier that killed off all those factories. And if he can kill that T3 HQ, then he can pretty much mop up this game no problemo whatsoever. Either that or uh, force a lot of torpedo bombers around to the left side and snipe that commander. But it's sitting under a bulwark, so not the easiest target on the face of planet Earth. Battlecruiser moving into the left, and here comes the harm fire. You can see the health nosediving on that battlecruiser. It is a shame to lose such a glorious ship of war. But I think he's going to. He's actually getting closer to the harms instead of farther away. Yeah, that guy is dead. He has realized his error and he is running as fast as he can. But he is going to for sure lose that one. There she blows. Now that battle cruiser hightailing it. It's too bad. If he brought that bulwark down, he could save some of the damage that's going down on there. But hey. 50 kills. Actually, a lot of that's engineers, so that's not as impressive as it may seem, but still, three veterans on a Neptune. Not something that you see every day. The Siren class is continuing to eliminate the Red Plague from the face of the Earth. 
not the best DPS on those, but they do get the job done when you need to eliminate some build power. T3 air still up. Ah, there we go. T2 torpedo bombers. Now we should be able to see something happening. TA for life, a little bit low on interceptors actually, and he does not have any cruisers anywhere near his commander. Torpedo bombers are going to go straight after the harms. And there is nothing, absolutely nothing, that TA can use to deny this. I would say that he can build SAMs, but if he starts building SAMs, the battle cruisers are just going to pick them off no problem whatsoever. ASF moving into guard. TA for life has no T3 air. Only T2, and he's building Corsairs. So those torpedo bombers are going to be very, very effective versus these harms. Couple of Corsairs in the back, gonna pick off one of the torpedo bombers, but there come the ASF. That is the end of that problem. Two cruisers moving up from the rear. Well, one anyway. That may actually be a spawn move order. Both of them are not coming. And Torps continuing to attack the harm. Why they're not just going after the commander, I don't know. He is too far out in the water to get away at this point. And there we go, targeting the commander. Well, TA, I hope you're happy. Because I believe you just threw away 95% map control, a massive eco advantage, a massive reclaim advantage, and proceeded to walk your commander into the naval space of your opponent and essentially suicide. If you'd had cruisers there, I could have understood. If you'd had Sam's there, I could have understood. This, I don't get it. I really do not get it. Well, TA for life went AFK last 10 minutes. That's why do not ever take it for granted and kudos to Shades of Blue for sticking in there. To be completely honest, I am more than a little disappointed in that ending. I did not realize that it would end like that. The naval play up to about the last 15 minutes was exceptional. And you could see how these players were manipulating the expansions, pushing back and forth, the good reclaim patterns, the good play, that kind of stuff. That's why I like doing these games, because if you watch the replays of the higher ranking players, you can see what you're supposed to do and what you're not supposed to do. And we saw both in this game, definitely. On the to-do list, expand early, expand efficiently, get your engineers out as quickly as you can and pick up every expansion that you can. And then you saw all the play trying to eliminate eco from one player, reclaiming behind Navy battles, all that kind of stuff playing together. On the do not do list, upgrade your commander and then walk it into your opponent's naval space with no air support. That's what you don't do. Alrighty guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. Don't forget about the map submissions. Play a few games on Crazy Rush. Send them in to me. I will cast the best looking one on Saturday. And good luck to all you commanders as you undergo that combat. I, mm, Crazy Rush is an interesting map. I'm just going to leave it at that. Most of you have already played it. It is a unique gaming experience. And I'm really looking forward to the games that come out of that. And without further ado, I am going to hit the road. As always, thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you in the next cast.